All right, hello everybody. This is chapter 26, uh, and this is the statistics modeling our world. Uh, oops, I should spell statistics right. Statistics modeling our world curriculum. Um, and in this chapter, uh, we are going to be talking about chi-square tests. And uh, we're going to talk about three different chi-square tests, the uh, chi-square goodness of fit test, the chi-square test of homogeneity, and the chi-square test of independence. Um, in this first video, we're going to be talking about the chi-square goodness of fit test. So let's go ahead and start. Our first example that we're going to look at here um, has to do with uh, professional baseball players. Uh, this is also uh, this is a, a real study that's been run. They've also run this very same study with uh, NHL players as well. Uh, if you're curious and you want to learn more about it, I really highly suggest uh, reading the book Outliers uh, by Malcolm Gladwell. It is a fantastic book. Um, that uh, goes into more detail about this and more studies. Uh, definitely worth a read if you want to go check it out. So, but here, it has been proposed by some researchers that children who are the older ones in their class at school naturally perform better in sports and that these children then get more coaching and encouragement. Could that make a difference in who makes it to professional level in sports? Um, so the data table on the following page here shows uh, the birth month of every major league baseball player from 1975 to 2006. Uh, so here we have uh, month 1 through 12, call that January through December. Um, and uh, there's the, the ball player count there in the middle is the total number in every month. And uh, over here on the right-hand column, we're comparing it to the national birth average. Notice we do have higher birth percentages in the later parts of the year, right? Nine or so months after winter when everybody's inside and bored. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to answer here um, is how many ball players of the 1478 accounted for would we expect to have in each month, right? So if we have this as our national birth percentage, if 8% of all people in the United States are born um, in January, then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, then how many of the 1400, uh, excuse me, 1478 uh, should we account for that? Uh, and so, we could go through and all we need to do is take uh, 1478 times 0 0.08 and that'll give us our expected amounts and we could write all of our expected amounts right there if we wanted to. However, um, I'm going to do a little calculator shortcut to make this a little bit easier uh, and faster most appropriately. Uh, so let's back out of this for a moment uh, and I've set up our calculator and I have placed all of this data inside our TI-84. And you will notice that I also have in list two the uh, national birth percentages. So what I'm gonna do in list three is create an entire list of the expected amount. Uh, so we're gonna take that 1478 and we're gonna multiply it by list two. Notice how I have the list three portion up here highlighted. And uh, when I hit enter there, Notice that it has populated a list of those expected amounts. So we would expect 118 to be here when 137 has. Oh, I got a I got a notification on my Facebooks. Better go check that out. Um, okay, <laughs> so I've made an expected list. Let's um, go back here. Oh, it's gonna stay. Okay, go away. There we go. Um, and I'm not going to write it on this slide because we're going to move on from this slide, but it's saved in my calculator, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is what's called a goodness of fit test. And this is a test uh, that checks whether the distribution of counts, I'm terrible today, uh, whether the distribution of counts in one categorical variable matches the distribution predicted by a model. And in this case, the model is the national birth rate, and we're seeing if the baseball player birth rate distribution matches the national birth rate distribution, okay? Um, so as usual, with every single model that we've had, there's assumptions and conditions that need to be considered. Um, some of these should not come as any kind of surprise at this point if you've gone through, if you've gone through and seen all of our hypothesis test videos. Um, the first one, which uh, for 
just so we're clear, for the AP exam, you do not need to explicitly state um, this one here. So do not state for the AP exam. Uh, you're just going to check to make sure that it's categorical data. Um, you don't need to write this one down for the AP exam. Uh, we're going to pretend that that last mark is an underline. Uh, and you don't need to check that one. You just need to make sure, okay, this is categorical data. I'm using this type of test. Uh, the one that should come as no surprise at this point is the randomization condition, right? Individuals have been counted and whose counts are available for now should be random sample from some population. Um, we can also say uh, appropriately representative. Uh, if lacking lacking the uh, randomness, as if it is a representative sample, that is the important part. Uh, so that should be no surprise. It should also be no surprise that we have a sample size assumption uh, that we need to have the, gosh, uh, that we need to have the uh, sample be big enough for it to be uh, useful. Uh, the technical size that this needs to be is that the expected values need to have at least five individuals in each cell. So that expected list that we just made on the calculator should be big and should be five in each. Um, it's very similar to your success and fail condition where it needed to be 10. This one technically only needs to be five though. <clears throat> so those are our assumptions and conditions. Uh, so does our situation with the baseball players fit a chi-square goodness of fit test? Um, does it, is it counted data? Absolutely it is. Uh, we're looking at categorical variables. Uh, birth months, so this is counted data. Can it does work? Uh, would we say that these things were independently drawn or, or randomly sampled? And uh, in this case, the uh, we had a census. So the census of baseball players um, is representative. So that's going to be okay. And then finally, our sample size, do we exp exceed the cell counts? And then in that, and if you remember, those exceed the expected counts were huge. So we can say all cells uh, were larger than 100 counts per cell. Therefore, the sample size is large enough. And again, make sure that when you're stating your assumptions and conditions, and this is an AP exam thing, uh, make sure that you are saying, uh, yes, it does pass, and give a reason for why it passes, right? You have to say, yes, it passes, and how you know it passes. So uh, we have all these things. So the final thing that we're going to write here is, uh, conditions have been met. For a chi square goodness of fit test. So assumptions and conditions, they're ready to go. Let's talk about the mechanics. Um, we want to know how well the observed data reflect the expected data. So we're going to be looking at the differences between the observed and the expected counts. That is, we're going to take the observed minus the expected. These differences are known as residuals. And uh, residuals is something that we'll go into more deeply about when we're talking about scatter plots. But a residual is a difference, right? Um, so we, when we add up residuals, uh, the differences result in a sum of zero, which isn't very helpful. Um, so what we're going to do, and this assumes that we've done regression, which you may or may not have done. Um, but what you do to take care of that is you square them. So instead of taking observed minus expected, uh, we're going to take observed minus expected squared. And so that gives us the... Um, the size of the residuals, uh, but to get an idea of the relative sizes of the differences, we're going to divide each of the squared differences 
by the expected count from that cell. Now, I'm going into detail here about how this chi-square statistic is found. Um, we're going to actually do it all in the calculator, but it is good to know where this comes from and what the chi-squared is actually looking at. We're looking at the differences between observed counts and expected counts. Um, so this is what we end up having, right? The test statistic, which is called the chi-square, or chi-squared statistic, is found by adding up the sum of the squares, observed minus expected, of the deviations between the observed and expected counts divided by the expected counts. So for every pair of observed minus expected, we're going to square it, divide it by the expected, and then we're going to add it up, right? Remember, that's what sigma means. We're going to add them all up uh, until we get the chi-square statistic. Um, the chi-square models are, again, a family of models like the t-distribution. Uh, it is dependent on the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom for this test is n minus 1, where n is the number of categories. Notice that it is not the number, it is not the sample size, it is the number of categories. Finally, here, the chi square the chi-square statistic is used only for testing hypotheses. It is not for constructing confidence intervals. Uh, we'll take a look at the chi-square uh, model uh, later, but it is not a normal model. It is actually a um, it is a, a, a skewed model, uh, skewed to the right. So it's going to actually kind of looks like that bottom one's probably a better representation. Um, and because it's not symmetric, we do not construct confidence intervals. Um, if the observed counts don't match the expected statistic, it can't be too small. So the chi-square test is always one-sided. If the calculated statistic value is large enough, we reject the null hypothesis. Um, they work like a one-sided test, but the interpretation of a chi-square test is in some ways many-sided, meaning that there are many ways that the null hypothesis can be wrong. Because our null hypothesis simply states if we know if it is the same or if it's not the same. Um, so here's kind of like a, uh, a summary of the actual calculation. Again, this is only if you have to do it by hand. We're going to do it with the calculator. Um, what were you going to find the expected values? That's what we did in the first slide. We're going to compute the residuals. We take the observed minus expected. We're then going to square those residuals. Then we're going to take this uh, observed minus ex ex expected squared over expected thing. And then we're going to find the sum. That's the chi-square statistic. Uh, we use the degrees of freedom, and then we use the chi-square statistic to find a p-value. Uh, so let's actually um, look at the null hypothesis here and then do the mechanics. So for back for our ball player example, um, the null hypothesis is that the distribution of birth months for major league ball players is the same as that of the general population. Notice that um, our hypothesis is not in symbols, right? Uh, in a chi-square test, our null hypothesis is always written out. Uh, but notice that it has the same <coughs> general format as our other ones, right? This null hypothesis very much sounds like an equality statement, right? We're saying that the distribution is the same, is equal to that of the general population. And the distribution of birth months for major league ball players differs from that of the rest of the statements. Notice that that makes a very does not equal to statement. So there's our hypotheses. Let's go ahead and do the statistics. So we're going to back out of this uh, thing again here. Keep those. Let's check this out. Okay, so um, I have my observed count in list one. I have my expected count count in list three. So we're going to go to statistics, tests, down a bunch till we get to the chi-square goodness of fit test. Uh, it is important to note that this is only on the TI-84. If you're using a TI-83 calculator, the chi-square goodness of fit test doesn't exist, and you will have to hand calculate it, or at least use the calculator to calculate all these things. But 
uh, putting in here, notice that it asks for the observed and the expected. Our observed list was in list one. Our expected list was in list three. And our degrees of freedom uh, is one minus the number of categories. We had 12 categories, so our degrees of freedom was 11. And there's our calculation. There's our chi-square statistic. There's our p-value, degrees of freedom. Uh, this CNTRB is actually a list of the chi-square statistics for each category uh, in which we add these together. We get the um, 26.484. If we added every number in this list, we would get 26.4844. So on the AP exam, you're going to list that stuff down. You're going to say um, over here, you're going to say what my chi-square statistic was. Uh, you know, you're going to say chi-square equals 26.84. I think that was what it was. And then you're going to say my p-value was 0 0.0055. And then you're going to make your conclusion, which uh, we write our conclusions the same way we always have. Uh, right? Remember, we take a craps. Uh, context, reject or fail to reject, assume significance, and state the p-value. So because of the small p-value, 0 0.005, right? Notice there's my stating my p-value. I reject the null hypothesis. There's my R. Uh, the evidence that the birth months of major league ball players have a different. Uh, there is evidence that birth months of major league ball players have different distribution from the rest of us. That is my context right there. And you will notice I'm actually missing the assume significance portion here. We should add a sentence that says, uh, "I'm going to reject the null hypothesis at an alpha level of." 0.05 and there we go there is a chi-square goodness of fit test if you've got questions comments concerns on this make sure you leave them in the comments or contact me uh, otherwise uh, thank you for watching and have a good day bye